We don't necessarily see things as they really are, but the devils see our position very clearly. Screwtape starts the twelfth letter talking about this discrepancy. We know that we have introduced a change of direction in his course, which is already carrying him out of his orbit around the enemy. But he must be made to imagine all the choices which have affected this change of course are trivial and revocable. He must not be allowed to suspect that he is now, however slowly, heading right away from the sun on a line which will carry him into the cold and dark of utmost space. And if this is us, we shouldn't take comfort with the fact that we are going to church. Wormwood's patient is still going to church. Scootape is almost glad that he's still attending because then the patient can be fooled into thinking that he's still in the orbit around God. As long as he retains externally the habits of a Christian, he can still be made to think of himself as one who has adopted a few new friends and amusements, but whose spiritual state is much the same as it was six weeks ago. And while he thinks that, we do not have to contend with the explicit repentance of a definite, full recognized sin, but only with his vague, though uneasy feeling that he hasn't been doing very well lately. Scootape explains that they need to deal carefully with this uneasy feeling. If it gets too strong, the human will realize his true position and run back to God. But if it gets too weak, then Wormwood won't be able to exploit it. If such a feeling is allowed to live, but not allowed to become irresistible and flower into real repentance, it has one invaluable tendency. It increases the reluctance of the patient to think about the enemy. All humans at nearly all times have some such reluctance, but when thinking of him involves facing an intensely and wholly vague cloud of half-conscious guilt, this reluctance is increased tenfold. The devils can create a situation similar to a woman who has been so humiliated in a golf game that she has an aversion to her golf clubs, or a guy who has argued adamantly against the right answer, and now, because of that, resists going back to trivia night next week. Yeah, that really happened. <laughs> it's the same with a patient when it comes to approaching Jesus. In this state, your patient will not omit, but he will increasingly dislike his religious duties. He will think about them as little as he feels he decently can beforehand and forget them as soon as possible when they are over. A few weeks ago you had to tempt him to unreality and inattention in his prayers, but now you will find him opening his arms to you, and almost begging you to distract his purpose and benumb his heart. He will want his prayers to be unreal, for he will dread nothing so much as effective contact with the enemy. His aim will be to let sleeping worms lie. When they get us into this state, the tempters will no longer have to try to use the real pleasures as temptations, which wasn't very effective to begin with. When the patient is reluctant to meaningfully engage with God, he will allow anything to distract him. You no longer need a good book, which he really likes, to keep him from his prayers or his work or his sleep. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper will do. You can make him waste his time not only in conversations he enjoys with people whom he likes, but in conversations with those he cares nothing about on subjects that bore him. You can make him do nothing at all for long periods. You can keep him up late at night, not roistering, but staring at a dead fire in a cold room. A column of advertisements in yesterday's paper? You know what the contemporary equivalent of that is? Scrolling on your phone. That whole last quote is about social media. It's the most effective tool today to prevent us from reading books we really like, from having conversations with people we like to hang around with, and most importantly, it keeps us away from meaningfully engaging with Jesus, when we kind of want to avoid him anyway. So a lot of people have this idea that it's God who's the cosmic killjoy. And if we get away from God and his rules, we can do all the fun stuff. This is just not so. Screwtape explains what the demon's goals are here. Oh, and think about all that scrolling that you do on your phone with this quote as well. To steal away a man's best years, not in sweet sins, but in a dreary flickering of the mind over it knows not what, and knows not why, in the gratification of curiosities so feeble that the man is only half aware of them, in drumming of fingers and kicking of heels, in whistling tunes that he does not like, or in the long, dim labyrinth of reveries that have not even lust or ambition to give them a relish, but which, once chance association has started them, the creature is too weak and fuddled to shake off. Wow. If we ultimately derive any pleasure from our rebellion, the devils will consider it a failure and work hard to make it not so. Wormwood is apparently typical of all young tempters. He wants to lead his patient into big awesome sins, like selling drugs and robbing banks or something. This is Screwtape's response. But do remember, the only thing that matters is the extent to which you separate the man from the enemy. It does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light. 
and out into the nothing. Murder is no better than cards if cards can do the trick. Indeed, the safest road to hell is a gradual one. The gentle slope, soft underfoot, without sudden turnings, without milestones, without signposts. Don't we sometimes take comfort in the idea that we are basically a good person? We don't break any of the Ten Commandments. Maybe we aren't Sermon on the Mount kind of Christians. But who is, am I right? We need to remember that the devil's purposes are not necessarily to get us to sin big. A bunch of little sins will do the trick. Thank you, and we'll see you next time.